by the mid 60s, uh, he was organizing specific projects to discredit psychiatrists and destroy them. Uh, Project Psychiatry is an example. You can see the rhetoric is becoming a little bit more inflamed. Um, we are now murderers. Uh, we are now rapists. Uh, he wants to find legal information against individual psychiatrists in England, and, and he attempted to do so. Um, he wrote another uh, missive called The War in 1969. Again, basically admitting that uh, instead of clearing the world or treating people with Scientology, his main focus has been to uh, destroy psychiatry. Um, so this is pretty significant. He's not, he's too smart though to just continue to, to beat this drum. He needed a, a way of, of being a little bit more successful, a little bit more mainstream in delivering uh, this message and in sort of achieving what he wanted to achieve. And so what he did in 1969, uh, he kind of co-opted um, Thomas Sass, who is a, in my opinion, somewhat uh, narcissistic um, psychiatric abolitionist who was famous in 1961 with the mental illness. He got Saz to give the sort of veneer of respectability to a new group that he called the Citizens Commission for Human Rights. CCHR is still strong. It has chapters in virtually every country you can think of. It is the sort of uh, the, 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 the missile cone of Scientology's efforts to destroy psychiatry, and it still remains so to this day. Today's war is uh, largely legal and political, and I could talk to you for hours about the sort of ways and techniques that Scientology and the CCHR has been sort of working behind the scenes, involved in politics. Um, a lot of propaganda, which is I think what we're going to be talking a little bit more about. Um, a lot of films with the titles that, that are projected up there. But again, a lot of a lot of rhetoric and propaganda goes out into the, into society, where on one hand some of it is very extreme and it's rejected. But what that allows for is space, and in that space comes other more subtle messages, more subtle assumptions that get played out in public and become part of the public discourse and part of the public idea. I sound a little bit paranoid. But I'm going to show you a, a few examples of, of these sort of these kind of memes. I guess that uh, Scientology has created against psychiatry. First one, psychiatry is a pseudoscience. Um, when you look at this, they first of all completely muck up the idea of what is a science and pseudoscience and what isn't. They, they argue that, that psychiatry is wrong, that psychiatry is incorrect, that we don't have the right treatments, our treatments fail, our treatments are dangerous, implying that there is a way of knowing that uh, some of a treatment can be good or bad. If you have a way of knowing that a treatment is good or bad, uh, or if a theory is falsifiable, it's arguable that that's not pseudoscience. Um, so they, they completely muck that. And, and the Tom Cruise interview is a brilliant example of that. It's actually very funny. Part of the pseudoscience argument is that diagnoses are invented and placed into a system arbitrarily, like psychiatrists sit around and discuss or debate, gosh, should we put that illness in there? What are the criteria for that? Let's pop that into the DSM system, you know, you know, let's go for a beer kind of thing. Um, and again, I would, I would challenge that on several levels. Um, we're debating the boundaries between how we define illnesses. We're not debating whether there are real illnesses or real conditions. And a great example in, in astronomy is Pluto. You know, Pluto was voted out of the list of planets a couple of years ago. But the reality of this sort of stone, uh, cold, frozen methane ball floating around the sun that didn't change at all, it's there. Um, but the debate amongst astronomers about whether to include it or not is a healthy part of science in all aspects. That doesn't make astronomy pseudoscience. Another good example of medicine is hypertension. These are the Canadian guidelines for the diagnosis of hypertension right now. You don't think that that is a result of a committee of experts sitting around trying to figure out a, you know, how to define hypertension? You know, 160 or 100, average over three visits, or 140, 
20 or 90 over five visits. But of course, it's different between the office and the home. Come on, you know. Uh, cardiologists and family practitioners are not called pseudoscientists, but the, the process by which they think and classify problems is, is identical to that in psychiatry. Uh, but we're the ones who, has to, who have to wear this, and, uh, and we wear it in society as well. Um, the boundaries and labels are debatable, but my point is that the actual core conditions or the core problems are incredibly real. Um, whatever you think of the diagnosis of schizophrenia, if you happen to fit the criteria that are listed in dsm 4 tr for that entity, um, you will, you know, a population of you will live on average, um, you know, 22 and a half years less than a population that doesn't qualify for that diagnosis. It means something. There's something significant there um, in all of these conditions, and, and and that transcends whether you know you're you're arguing over whether it's a true condition or not. Um, it's a way of identifying populations at risk of nothing else. Second one is there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. I suspect you've all heard that expression. Um, that's a straw man argument um, based on what we call the monoamine hypothesis from the 1960s, which is you know depression is caused because you don't have enough serotonin or you don't have enough norepinephrine. And we're going to give you this pill to improve the levels of this stuff up in your brain, and therefore you're going to be fine again. That has not been taught to psychiatrists uh, as standard understanding of, of these issues for, for decades. Um, we use it today in talking to patients sometimes uh, to reduce stigma because people come and say, well, it's my fault. You know, I'm weak, I'm stupid, I'm depressed. It's like, no, you've got a chemical imbalance. I mean, it's, it's a simple expression to try to focus someone to their brain as opposed to their character. Um, but Scientology has popularized this, and so it's like there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance, there's no such thing as biological underpinnings of mental illness, there's no such thing as anything. And um, these days, you know, the emphasis is, uh, I'm gonna skip this, uh, on neuroplasticity, which is taking this concept far, far further, and again, sort of suggesting that we're not a pseudoscience, we're making progress. The uh, chemical imbalance thing is also based largely on Saz's argument. His core argument in the myth of mental illness and in his entire career, he's, still, he's 90 years old and he's still publishing, is based on a mind-body dualism that would leave Rene Descartes rolling in his grave. Um, basically, what Saz argues is that there are physical illnesses and there are mental illnesses. And if these psychiatrists come up and say, look, this mental illness actually has a biological underpinning, then he would say, well, it's not a mental illness. It's a physical illness. So there's still no such thing as mental illness. It's, it's, that is what his argument is. And if you read his book, it, there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, but that has sort of uh, seeped into to society. 